Hello, welcome to everyone to our next session in the Paidera Global Edition 2022, no, 2021, but it's still the time is, is going fast. Uh, my name is Jana. I'll be your host for uh, this session. I'm super happy to be here. Now I will introduce our speaker, Jan. Jan is the CEO and uh, Principal Data Scientist at Coefficient. His experience in data science and software engineering spans multiple industries and applications, and his passion for the power of data extends far beyond his work for, co for co coefficient clients. In April 17, he created Exist 50 in order to predict the UK general election using open data and advanced modeling techniques. Previous experience includes lead data scientists at Yplan, business analytics at Apple, Genomics Research and Imperial College London, building an end tech startup in Nodium, developing a strategy and technological infrastructure for international non-profit startup, SDIR Education, and losing his sleep to many hackathons along the way. John is also co-organizer of PyData Bristol, co-found uh, Humble Data in 19 to promote diversity in data science through a program of free boot camps. And in 2020, was a committee chair for the PyData Global Conference. So we have a former member here. He is currently a fellow of Newspeak House with interest in open data, AI ethics, and promoting diversity in tech. Today, he's going to speak about agile data science, how to implement agile workflows for analytics and machine learning. So you're welcome and the connection is yours. Thank you ever so much, Diana. Uh, so uh, my objective for this talk is to make this the most valuable talk you watch at PyDC Global 2021 as measured by your team's productivity in 2022. So what's the big deal about agile? I'm sure you've heard of it. It's a big thing. 71% of organizations were using it, and this is 2018. 98% uh, of companies who did try it said that they benefited from adopting Agile. 60% of those companies saw revenue and profit growth after using it. And Agile projects, as measured by PwC, are 28% more successful than traditional projects. These slides will be made available. I'll tweet them out after this talk. And uh, these are all linked and sourced, so you can uh, dig into these stats. Uh, so here's the outline of the talk, going to talk about motivations, what is Agile, how do we actually go through it. It's more of a, what do I wish I'd known a year ago when I was just starting to apply it to our data science teams. So motivations. This is one of my least favorite questions as a consultant when a client says, how long is this thing going to take? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And they say, come on, ballpark. I'm like, oh, because this is a recipe for unhappy bunnies. The date comes along. We're not ready. The client's upset because they've made promises. My team is upset because they've worked overtime. Uh, the way we're working just isn't working. Uh, and so there are all sorts of ways of doing this. Can't we just get better at estimating? People are bad at estimating. For example, the Sydney Opera House estimated to take four years, $7 million. It took 14 years, $100 million. Even when you can throw all the best consultants at projects, we just have a habit of going over time, over budget. So maybe there's another way. So here's my journey into Agile. Six years as a uh, principal data scientist coefficient. And only in the last year, about a year ago, I read a book. I read this, I really recommend, if this is the one thing you take away, go get this book, it's fun. Uh, it's, a, it's a novel about IT and DevOps, and it's a bit too close to the bone if you work in corporate IT. So in 2021, I find myself managing three data science teams, up to three workshops a day, three coefficient, uh, multiple side projects, and also running the company and the one-to-ones and uh, all the finance and legal stuff that comes with running a company. And I think the thing that made this work for us was really going deep into Agile. Uh, so I'm just going to say this now. There's a load of the stuff that we have learned, way more than I can fit into 30-minute talk, is behind this link. This is the first time for this talk only uh, that we've opened up basically our own internal playbook as to how we do Agile. So check it out. Uh, so first of all, what is this thing? Let's go through some terminology. There's a lot of buzzwords. Are they needed? I don't know, but we need to know the buzzwords for me to teach you this. So Agile, it's just a system to manage your work using time-limited iterations. Those iterations are called sprints, one, two, four-week cycles, and you're delivering working increments. What does that mean? It's output that can be tested or reviewed. So if you're building an uh, ETL pipeline, then uh, by the end of that sprint, someone can actually review a partially working ETL pipeline. Or if it's an analysis, there's some analysis some can review and feedback on. The whole idea is to get feedback from your stakeholders, from your managers, whoever it's going to sooner, because they might just flag something that puts a real spanner in the works. And it's good to know these things sooner rather than later. 
Then we talk about stories. A story is a single unit of work, usually completed within a sprint. For me, this is 20 minutes, a few days of work. Uh, so that's what we call a story. And then an epic is a collection of stories related together. This is actually a really nice way of organizing your work. I don't see a lot of data science teams necessarily organizing their work into stories and epics. I think it's great because if we've got the epic of improve the marketing team's uh, data capacity uh, in Q3 2021 as an epic, and we can see all of the related epics going back the last couple of years, I am laying the breadcrumbs for future data science teams to understand what's been done before. And so it's all about reproducible data science. You can actually do this and help your future teams find out what's been done before. And they might just find that you've done something before, you learned a load of things that were non-intuitive at the time, and they can save themselves days or weeks of time of not doing that thing or just updating your code and making it a little bit more modern, but just rerunning it, it's much faster. So uh, I'm gonna go through some myths in today's uh, talk. First of all, Agile is a methodology, it's not. It's a bunch of values and it's a bunch of principles. It's not a methodology. There are, however, lots of different methodologies that adhere to the Agile philosophy. Uh, most of them, uh, most people think this is just Scrum, but there are other methodologies available. Scrum, Kanban, Lean, Extreme Programming, you may have heard some of these things. Most people, if I ask them, they're like, yeah, we're Agile-ish. So I'm not gonna be going deep into too many of these. I'm basically just giving you, here is a methodology you can copy. It's what we've implemented in multiple uh, client data teams this year. We found it to work. We've really iterated it. So this is our approach to Agile agile-ish. So a little bit more terminology. What is lean? It's the Toyota production system. If you read lean startup, that's the Toyota production system applied to companies. It's about iterations, quick iterations, learning cycles, and evolving your workflows as well. Kanban, visualize your stories on a board. Um, through a workflow. One nice feature is limiting the amount of stories, limiting the work in progress you have. Uh, factories are really good at doing this. They know that if you've got lots of stuff piling up, then you end up just doing loads of work, managing all the work. And Kanban helps to prevent that. So you actually, by focusing on doing less, you do more, you do it faster. Then the Scrum, which is a very step-by-step -step system. We're gonna be deep diving into Scrum a little bit today. Uh, Scrum talks about the backlog. This is just all the things you might want to do but not necessarily have authorized to do quite yet. Then there's your stand-up. Lots of people do stand-ups, especially in remote working teams, short daily team meetings to check progress. Although most teams, I think, do stand-ups wrong. They talk about like, what did the people do today, yesterday? I think you should be reviewing your Kanban board. Where are all the stories and the items that we're working on? And then the relevant people can speak as to their progress and the blockers and what's going on there. So there's, there's one little tip. So we're talking about Scrum. What is Scrum? It's just a life cycle, step by step by step. So uh, you have your product backlog, basically your epics. Your epic could be deploy my machine learning model. Within that epic, it's broken down into a bunch of stories. These form your sprint backlog. And so let's say we're gonna select the following stories. We're gonna create an API, uh, version our data with DVC and deploy to AWS Lambda. That's uh, what my team is gonna try and achieve in the next two week sprint. So that's our sprint backlog. Once selected, we go into the sprint process and that's just um, you know very uh, daily quick check-ins, but otherwise letting the team self-organize, self, -organize, self uh, stay on top of their own communications and broadly focus on getting the job done. At the end of that sprint, we've then got a working increment of the software. So let me give you the meetings and our agendas. Please feel free if you've never tried Agile, steal these slides and just literally apply our technique and start from there. So I'm gonna start with myth number three. Lots of people think Agile is very undisciplined because lots of executives in business say, yeah, we do Agile. What they mean is what, they're nimble or they didn't really have a strategy and they're just pretending Agile is not having strategy. This is nonsense, okay? So don't fall for it, uh, call people out on that help educate your leaders. And if you're a leader watching this, um, I hope you enjoy this. I hope this is educational for you. Come and talk to me. I'm very happy to chat further. So here's our agenda for the most important meeting, I think, I don't know, maybe retros and more so, but sprint planning, the start of sprint, maybe 30 minutes, you can adjust this as you go. Uh, and so find out what's your resource availability. Let's say we've got two team members. Alice is available for full 10 days of a two week sprint. Uh, Bob, only two days, he's uh, on holiday. Uh, then what's your goal? Our goal for the sprint broadly, is we want to deploy our machine learning model. So then we write up our stories, we figure out what are the stories that we need so we can achieve that goal. And then we select the stories to move into the sprint. Then we go through an uh, estimation process. I'm gonna go into this shortly, where we estimate how much effort it's gonna be, how much value it's going to be. Through that, we identify if there's anything that's huge amounts of effort and high risk. Also, if there's things that are high effort, low reward. Let's maybe think about whether they should be in the sprint right now. And de-scope those items as appropriate. 
Meeting number two, this is the sprint look ahead. This is, so we work in two week sprints. And so every other week we've got our mid sprint look ahead. And this is getting into a really nice productivity tip. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, especially whenever our affairs seem to be in crisis, we're almost compelled to first give our attention to the urgent present rather than the important future. So if you've seen the Eisenhower matrix, the sprint look ahead is basically a hack to protect us from ourselves and focus on the non-urgent important things. It's so much easier to decide what's important when it's a week away in a look ahead versus it's the sprint starts tomorrow and everything's urgent right now. Let's just focus on the urgent stuff. So it's a really nice hack. Uh, I really recommend trying these out. So you're focusing on just what's happening in the next sprint, not this one. We'll review this one well, literally every day through a 15 minute uh, stand up. And then what are the, the tickets we might want to add in to capture our higher level priorities? So it's taking a step back, the 10,000 foot view. Then we have uh, the end of sprint meeting. This is a sprint review. Or if you've got clients or bigger stakeholders, you can have a sprint showcase, which is really fun. You just get to say, right, this is our new uh, iterable uh, working you know, product stage. And we review what's been delivered, what's been done, what's not been done. Is there anything that we didn't estimate very well? So what do we know? It's a forced meeting that forces you to learn things and think about how do we improve our process. Uh, but you celebrate the wins. It's a very celebratory meeting. Also just thinking of all the things that are not yet done, do we even have a definition of done? How do we know when to stop in the world of machine learning or analytics or R&D? You can really go deep into a rabbit hole sometimes. So having a clear definition of done. And sometimes that's literally, we're gonna spend one sprint just optimizing this model. We're gonna try everything we can to optimize this model. Then we're gonna check in, see what the model accuracy and the model performance is and decide if we want to uh, reinvest another sprint in further optimization. And that at some point is a conversation with your stakeholders. It's a business decision. Uh, model uh, recall and precision have gone up by 5% in the last two weeks of effort. Is that worth it for another 5% from another two weeks? It depends how much that 5% is worth to the company. So it's a really nice uh, flow that I think fits nicely into, into data science teams. Then we have the retrospective. I actually think maybe this is the most important meeting. Uh, it's also the one that is most likely to be skipped. So it's your opportunity to get together with your team and just reflect uh, what's gone well, what could have gone better? What do we change about our process? The reason I think it's the most important meeting is because it doesn't really matter how you start agile or what form or flavor you choose. As long as you have a retrospective, you're going to have the opportunity to evolve your process uh, to go from four week sprints to two week sprints or getting rid of your Kanban or uh, getting rid of all of Scrum. As long as you have this, you can evolve your process. That's, that's the killer part of this for me. Uh, so the other thing is be very kind to each other. I really think there's uh, a nice thing called the prime directed by Norm Kerf. Regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could given what they knew at the time, their skills, abilities, resources available, and the situation at hand. This uh, I've, I've learned from uh, there's a fantastic agile company called Made Tech in the UK, and I really recommend uh, their book. They've got a whole book on agile team. Uh, so how to run a retro, there's a lot more in that book. I'll show that at the end in my resources. So we've got our four meetings. And if you just start doing those meetings, you're on the way to agile in a big way. Like that's almost the whole thing. Uh, but one of those was involving adding estimates into effort and value. So how do we go about doing that? Okay, so myth number four, Agile can't meet deadlines. I think that's nonsense. Okay, so Agile projects have been proven to be less likely to fail, proven to have a greater speed to market. Why is that? Well, if you're aiming to do less in each sprint, you actually deliver stuff, you get feedback sooner, higher communication, uh, which all in all of this is, is proven to be a faster turnaround. So you get to your end goal sooner. So greater speed to market. You also have higher quality code. Your teams are also more motivated and productive. On average, this is not a promise. It's just research and statistics uh, have, have found this is on average what Agile projects deliver. However, I think when it comes to deadlines, you have fixed sprint cycles. Your team gets really good as you get into your fourth, fifth, sixth sprint uh, into understanding roughly what can be done in a two week sprint. They get much better at estimating, I can promise you that, between your first sprint and your fifth sprint, they're gonna be way better at estimating uh, what a large task is versus a small task, uh, about actively thinking through, what are the things that might go wrong here? What's the worst case scenario? Do I really know how to deploy something to AWS Lambda, or am I just being really over-optimistic there? And then you have the review process and the retro, which forces getting even better at the estimation and understanding what is capable of delivering. 
and you're measuring all of that along the way. So your teams become better at forecasting how long things will take. The more you do agile, which means I think it's much more likely to deliver to schedules because you're going to have more accurate conversations right up front about what's possible. And if things do come up, you've got a really, really uh, fantastic communication workflow uh, that all of your stakeholders and your team can understand exactly where things are through your Kanban boards, for example. So that's a little myth. So how do we do estimation in the face of uncertainty? Software is hard enough. Data science is even harder. Like machine learning estimation, kind of tricky. Uh, so the trick here is people are great at relative estimates. So let's say uh, here's a couple epics that we're going to work on this sprint. We've got some stories around deployment. And let's try this really cool new looking uh, light GBM star model that's now in scikit-learn. Uh, so what we do is we first of all estimate our effort points. These are also called story points. I think effort points are slightly more descriptive. So what is an effort point? It's not time, it's effort. Because someone who's been, uh, I don't know, uh, coding for five, 10 years is maybe faster at building a fast API app than someone who's just started out. So it's not time, it's effort. And you all agree on relative effort most of the time. For someone who's built a fast API app several times, I'm pretty sure Sebastian Ramirez is gonna build a fast API app faster than I will. And so again, effort is not equal to time, but it is relative to each other. So all we say is I recommend t-shirt sizing, small, medium, large, if you have to go higher, but try and keep it relatively um, constrained. Now you'll notice the numbering system is a Fibonacci sequence. So one, two, three, five, eight, 13. Why is that? Because as we go from large to extra large, we get really, it's really hard to dif uh, differentiate between, is that four points, five points, six points? It's reflecting the uncertainty of estimating a large task or a large story. It's it's literally, it's impossible. So let's uh, increase the increments as we go up those uh, those levels from large to extra large and beyond. That's a, a, a really, really nice system and uh, has worked well for us. So we've got some effort points in. We're basically saying all, all of our team agree that deploying to AWS Lambda is a really hard task for us given our background and our skills and is much harder than building the fast API app. It's much harder than uh, throwing in DVC into the system. It's much harder than just uh, the, the, the 20 character change of switching our model out and rerunning our test suite. So that's our effort points. And if your teams don't agree, the planning meeting is where you say, okay, why do you think that's a one and you think that's a five? Maybe there's something we missed there. Maybe there's some uncertainty. Maybe there's uh, things we didn't anticipate. So let's have that conversation. We get better at planning collaboratively. So your developers or your data science, your team is estimating effort. The stakeholders, which is sometimes just the team manager, estimates value. And so the value doesn't always equal the effort. Some things are really easy to do and just provide insane amounts of value. Some things are really hard to do and are not that valuable. So uh, again, we throw in some value points along the same system. Then we can just calculate a value per effort score, sort by that score, identify some dependencies or tasks that have to happen in a certain order, and then just do a rank ordering. And this is great because now for the rest of the sprint, I, my team can just start taking tasks from the top, knowing that they're working on the most valuable work given the effort. And the tasks near the bottom, they're more like the nice to haves. Uh, they're more effort, they're less value. So self-organizing teams that requires much less management through that sprint cycle. Now, if you're first implementing this for the first time, sprint number one, don't worry about this. Like just make up the numbers and see what happens. Uh, review at the end, calculate the total effort points completed, and then calculate what we call a velocity score, which is how many effort points did you complete in your sprint cycle or per day? And that gives you your rough estimate as to how many uh, effort points do we even put on the board for the next sprint? And you're going to get better once you start tracking your velocity, you're going to get better at tracking more tasks. And also there's a really curious effect. Your velocity is going to go up over time. So this is our velocity and value delivered by my operations team um, over, over the last few months. And what's happened here is we've got better at prioritizing more high impact work. Better ROI work is going to each sprint and the lower uh, value work is uh, maybe being uh, delayed until later or even just we're realizing it's not as high value as everything else we're doing at the moment. So an amazing thing starts to happen. Now this will tail off as time as you just get really good at consistently delivering high value work. Uh, but uh, this is something you will grow to become accustomed to. What is your velocity? Uh, for a team of two people, maybe 60 effort points in two weeks. Do you take into account host status law? It always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account host status law. 
top tip. Okay, so segueing into some more practical tips and tricks learned from the last 12 months of me trying this out uh, as a total newcomer. So uh, stories can roll over into the next sprint. You haven't finished something, just roll it over. Don't try and get your team to finish everything in time. Uh, communicate upwards really carefully. Send people this video uh, and just understand that things change, bugs happen, data science is hard. It's literally research and development. Uh, allow for that uncertainty. Uh, don't make your teams burn out trying to just hit their sprint deadlines. That's crazy. Uh, discuss why your teams underestimated these things. Revise the effort points going to the next sprint, learn from that, become better at forecasting, and it all ends up sort of in the wash. Over several sprints, you're gonna claim the points in the next sprint, it doesn't matter. Uh, daily stand up, make it about the items, not the people. And also lots of people do stand ups like first thing in the morning, consider other times, have a conversation with your team. Is 9 a.m. really the best time for your team? Maybe they just wanna come into work and just crack on with the thing that they were halfway through when they finished yesterday. Uh, so we do a midday stand up, uh, which we learned from another London startup works really well for us. Okay. Use spikes. If you're not sure about how long something's going to take, don't spend forever trying to estimate it. Use a fixed time box window. Say, okay, we don't know how to deploy onto a Google cloud function. We've never done that before. Uh, we don't know how to estimate how long that will take. So what we're going to do is a three hour spike. This one person's going to go and just spend three hours researching it. Effectively, that's enough time we think into how long it's going to take to know how long it will take to then go ahead and do that or to break it down into the right stories. So if you can't estimate things, uh, just build the uncertainty and that's a, you know, a three hour spike, a three point story in your board. Never skip retro. It's too valuable. It's your optimization process uh, and your teams will not forgive you if you skip this continuously over and over again. It doesn't matter how important the deadlines are. Uh, this is an investment in your team's future productivity. I think it's a really nice idea to align your epics with quarters as in have a definition of done on your epics. If you use OKRs, it works really well, the OKRs. It forces you to actually look at the big headline stories that you're looking at and say, do we actually still want to do this? Is this still valuable for the business? Or have we now just spent three months trying to build a machine learning model for one shot learning? And it turns out this is really hard and it's like a, uh, 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 we need a whole research team of uh, PhDs and postdocs to achieve this. And maybe we bit off more than we can chew. So conscious story re rollover. It also is an opportunity to reprioritize and readdress your technical debt that may have gained in the quarter. Evolve your system through retros. Let your team innovate. They will understand how to be more productive for themselves. And finally, don't try to replicate someone else's agile. Like not, you know, make it your own. Uh, your company's culture is unique. Your team's culture is unique. So just let things evolve and learn what works for you. Okay, so some tools of the trade. This is what we've used. This is what works well for us. If you're just wondering, where to start. Uh, we use GitLab predominantly for our own internal work, but we use Jira GitHub projects um, for client work. We've done some ZenHub uh, work and ZenHub is a uh, like a GitHub uh, Chrome plugin that sort of does stuff on GitHub and then they've got their own SaaS service. So it's a really nice agile project management tool for GitHub. Uh, and I've dabbled with that and I think that actually looks really nice. So uh, it's a hard call between GitLab and ZenHub because ZenHub has all the effort points and value points built into it, as well as things like planning poker. Uh, spreadsheets we use a lot of because we can just automate the connections of data between like GitHub APIs into spreadsheets. And then uh, this works really well for stuff that GitLab or whatever tool we're using for the client doesn't work so well. We can just throw the data in, capture the effort points and the value points from the client, sort by our, uh, our value scoring and off we go. Also means we can do all the analytics on top. We actually use Monday for our agile operations. We use range is really honest to all discovered this last quarter for async standups, meeting automation, OKR tracking, and then Metro Retro is my favorite tool for retrospectives. Don't just do retros with like a, a notebook or meeting notes or whatever. Use a proper uh, a retro tool like Miro or Metro Retro, it's fun. Confetti at the end is great. Okay, so Myth number five, agile is for software teams. It's absolutely not. Um, marketing agile uh, uh, is, is a increasingly popular. Agile ops is also increasingly popular. Here is a little insight into just how we do agile within our own startup operations. And it works really well. Uh, our team is really enjoying it. We're moving faster. We're delivering more. We've got the Kanban board there. If you've got an ops team and you want to replicate our little board, we can just talk to us and, and uh, we'll give that away for you. Okay, so last few minutes, uh, advice for leaders. So if you are running a team, 
uh, I'm speaking to you now. And if you are a member of a team, uh, again, send this video to your, to your senior leaders if you like the idea of Agile. And uh, this is my advice. So first of all, Agile is, for startups, total myth, okay? John Deere, huge tractor farming manufacturer, implemented Agile years ago. They saw 75% reduction in their project cycle times, developing machines from uh, eight months instead of sort of two, three years. Uh, their teams were happier much happier. Uh, the velocity, how much work you're doing per sprint, increased 2x, 3x, 5x, 9x. Uh, amazing improvement in just productivity. And it's not just quantity over quality, they actually were able to prove their quality also measurably improved. So it's really fantastic for your team leaders. Um, article on Harvard Business Review, which I've linked to here called Embracing Agile with loads more of these case studies. Also, Agile is the best practice delivery standard for UK government projects. Uh, one of my other favorite resources is the gov.uk uh, service delivery manual on Agile delivery, step-by-step -step 101 to Agile. So here's my advice for your leaders. Lead with questions, not with orders. Okay, don't tell your teams how you want things done. Let them figure them out. Tell them what you'd like to do. If it's good enough for George Patton, it's good enough for me. Uh, Guide them with the questions. Understand how could we test these things? How are we going to measure this? And through doing so, you will grow your technical leads and becoming better general managers. Don't switch to Agile too quickly. 63% of the organizations that failed in Agile is most often because of clashes between business culture and Agile philosophy. So don't switch your entire company to Agile in one go. Do it in small batches. Uh, send everyone the video, see who's interested, so start there, iterate, learn, tweak, adapt your process, uh, build success stories in terms of inside your company and uh, just iterate, be lean, use agile to do agile. So final tips and tricks, uh, next steps, recommended reading. Made Tech have great, written this great book. It's free online downloadable ebook, uh, building high performance agile teams. I've learned so much from that book uh, of just how to get things done. Then the Phoenix Project, I just think it's really fun. It's a novel. It's kind of funny, kind of painful because it's so close to home. Uh, and uh, if you get the book version, it includes the DevOps handbook in the back, uh, which is then like a really like step-by-step -step checklists and the Agile Service Delivery Manual, as I, as I mentioned. Finally, uh, I'll leave the slide up a, a moment longer, uh, bit.ly forward slash pydata hyphen uh, agile. And you can see just a little table of contents. This is uh, just uh, opened up our own playbook because this is not our core competency. We do analytics and data and machine learning and stuff, uh, but we've learned all of this and I'm quite happy to try and share it. So what you get here is sort of step-by-step -step agendas, notes about how to do this well. Uh, we're continually adding to this. We have just a very agile lean process about how we run our own internal operations uh, and then all of the tricks and the links. And I'll put this video once it's available publicly, I'll put this video link there as well. So thank you very much. Uh, you can uh, find our, our details here. Feel free to reach out to us if you want to talk to me about anything I've talked about today. And otherwise, have a great Pi to Global. I will be in the gala uh, afterwards to take questions and in the slacks. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your nice talk. I'm sure that all of the attendees uh, enjoyed and also learned many things. Excellent. I am screenshotting all of these questions and I will answer them in the Slack somewhere. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, Thank you very you much, everyone. John.